Okay. Well, greetings, everybody. This is Paulina Vasiliev with Pacifica Radio. We're speaking on October 10th, and as the U.S.-Israeli genocidal war in Gaza enters its second year, with the U.S.-supported Israeli occupation forces currently attacking Lebanon and threatening to provoke a wider regional war. Our guest today is Argentinian journalist and documentary filmmaker Sebastián Salgado. Today's topic, uh, Zionism in Argentina. Uh, Javier Millet was elected president of Argentina in 2023. A self-proclaimed libertarian, Millet has quickly hit the Argentinian working class with extreme austerity as inflation is out of control and more and more Argentinian families are falling into extreme poverty. Millet is also a self-proclaimed Israel supporter. So, uh, Sebastian, maybe to start, how do we explain uh, the rise of Javier Millet to power at what and uh, what interests does he serve? Hi, Paulina. Nice to talk to you and being once again in your show. Um, it's uh, hard to explain because Millet, um, he built himself as someone that came from out of politics. And for most of the Argentinian people, that was a good reason enough because of their anger against the government, uh, the one that was at the moment he became elected and the one before. Um, a lot of people in Argentina uh, are uh, anger with the politics, the traditional political parties, because they don't uh, feel like part of the projects that they have for the country. So Millet came into politics uh, saying that he was going against that kind of people and that he will fight, you know, against the politicians that are part of the system. So many people believe that, but in the other hand, we have to, to understand that uh, he is a project very near to what we know here as the right wing somehow. But at the same time, uh, he had no political party. He has no, no bands like uh, President um, Zelensky in Ukraine uh, was someone uh, built um, with the media. He was an actor and he had um, some kind of a film that he became the president of Ukraine because in that play he was a university teacher. Okay, Millet is more or less the same because he was related with all the media related uh, with uh, Israel in Argentina. And little by little, he was building... Um, this person that uh, represent the interest of the common people in Argentina against the politicians. And one of the things that he made believe the people that uh, if um, they wanted, they could have their own salaries in American dollars, for example. So uh, if you have... Uh, some kind of an income in, let's say, uh, 2,000 Argentinian pesos. Uh, now you will have the same income, but in American dollar, which is stupid because of the inflation we have in this country. But many people believe that, and that other part of the anger against the traditional political parties uh, was uh, at least one of the reasons of why he became the president of this country now. Uh, you, I've heard you uh, assert very clearly that, in your opinion, Javier Millet is also a product of Israel, uh, a product of Zionism. Now, uh, some people uh, listening to us may not know, but the father of Zionism, Theodore Herzl, in 1896, in his famous book, uh, The Jewish State, the uh, Jugendstadt, uh, had a chapter uh, with the you know, dedicated to the following question, Palestine or Argentina? Uh, can you take it from there? Yes, sure. Uh, in that moment, you know, the Jewish state was not a reality. It was just a political idea. Um, they were not so sure if the religious uh, 
uh, excuse, let's say, to build the state of Israel was good enough. And they knew also that it was a very large country um, with small population in South America, which is Argentina, that they uh, decide that could be one of the choices. So we are not sure if they decide only for one of the choices. Of course, we can see what is going on in Palestine since the last at least 76 years, but at the same time, we have a very big influence for the Zionist lobby in this country, in all the political parties, not only with Millet, but Millet somehow it's a creation of the Zionist media, media that controls uh, almost every TV station in Argentina. And we could see, you know, as soon he became the president, he started, you know, uh, showing how close uh, was, he, was he with some uh, very uh, strange uh, Jew uh, sects. Let's, let's, let's put it that way. Um, because... Jewish uh, sect. Yes, a sect. Yes. Um, because uh, he went to the United States um, to be with them. And these people have, uh, you know, uh, trials against them, investigations against them, even in New York, because they are supposed to be related with the abuses of child. There's tunnels behind their, uh, the buildings that uh, they belong, in which they could not explain what, what they were for because uh, they found you know uh, toys they found so many things related to small kids that they could not explain but uh, at the same time milated uh, decide to be near to these people and somehow it's very obvious that they were related uh, with the uh, financial part of his political campaign as the same way the ipac is related in the political campaigns right now in both sides and the Democrats um, and the Republicans uh, party. So uh, he um, showed somehow uh, very close to the Zionist uh, organizations, even here in Argentina, which are very related with the right wing of some of the political parties. And um, he is showing uh, every time he can uh, this kind of uh, Islamophobic campaign, uh, trying to say that uh, uh, Muslim people is related to terrorism, like that uh, narrative related to Israel. He wants to bring it even here to Argentina. Because as you know, we have two terrorist attacks here in the 90s, in 1992. Um, the Israel embassy, and in 1994, a building related to the Jew community. So after do those two terrorist attacks, no one can say anything against the Jew community, because if you say so, it's like if they put you in the way that you uh, support those uh, terrorist attacks. So Millet it's uh, some kind of a, a part of that uh, narrative. And this year, in July 18, it became the 30th anniversary of those uh, terrorist attacks. And he showed himself very close to those uh, Zionist organizations. Mm. Now, uh, this is Javier Millet. And as you've uh, quite clearly indicated, he is not necessarily the only uh, Zionist force in town. What I mean by that is you mentioned that the media is uh, very much under the control of, um, of Zionists. The, the presence of uh, that sect you mentioned, Chabad Lubavitch in Argentina is, to my understanding as well, quite large. But yeah, um, that, that, that one is, yeah. a, is the Jew sect that I just mentioned. It's Jewish, uh -huh, yes. yes. Uh -huh. Right, right. Now, uh, so... Here's the thing, uh, Javier, Javier Millet is president, but uh, the, the presence of, um, 
uh, the control of Zionism in, in Argentina goes prior to that. Tell me, tell me about the Israeli company uh, Mekorot, who is now even now in the news for uh, for denying uh, water uh, to um, millions of Gazans who are also starving, to denying water on the West Bank as well. Are they're stealing um, the Palestinians' water, and apparently they are now in Argentina. Is that right? Yes, it is. Um, Mekorot, it's a military company that uh, steals the water uh, of the Palestinian people. If they have to, you know, um, they can change the course of a river. They deny the right of Palestinians of make even, you know, a hole to, to try to find water. I, they don't even let them to try to catch the water from rain. So many people in Palestine, especially in Gaza right now, um, are dying because of the lack of water that Mekorot company steals from them. That's why Mekorot always like to say that Israel was a desert, uh, a desert, sorry, a desert. <laughs> yes. uh, and now it's a kind of a garden, you know, Some, maybe like the European people like to say. Right, sounds like the gardener of Europe. Um, uh, Joseph Borrell. Yes, Joseph yes. Borrell, that's right. More, that's or less, right. more or less the same. Yes. So we have to uh, say that uh, it's not from this government, but the previous Peronist government, um, the interior uh, ministers was a, a person, uh, his name is Guadalupe Pedro, a person related with human rights. He went to, he went to Israel and signed a contract for Mekorot to come to Argentina and control of the water plants of many provinces. They are already in 10 Argentinian provinces since the last year. So somehow Israel is controlling the water of half of the Argentinian population, even right now. And that is something that not many Argentinian people really know about. And at the same time, uh, all the companies that are coming here to get um, minerals, let's say, I don't know, uh, gold, whatever uh, mine that they, they're working for, they need a lot of water. And they have guaranteed all the water they need because this Zionist company, Mekorot, is going to sell them the Argentinian water uh, for these companies that somehow are related one to, to each other. All right. Well, uh, water and also my understanding is that um, it seems like the Zionist interests, Israeli interests are buying up land uh, as well. So it does seem that this uh, question of uh, Palestine or Argentina um, is, is something that is still pressing for or should be at least on Argentinians' minds in terms of um, the way... Uh, the Zionist project is treating the indigenous people of Palestine uh, could could some could be something that could become a threat to uh, to other places because uh, as as you may uh, I mean as we may know um, the Israel is under a lot of pressure right now and an apartheid state uh, no matter uh, how much uh, the U.S. supports it um, is. Uh, hopefully not a project that will continue for the for the long term it's obvious uh, that um, israel since the last uh, iranian attack using the ballistic uh, missiles uh, it shows that the people in that country are not safe so it seems to me that they are searching for another place in, in case that they have to leave the occupied Palestine. And Argentina, it seems to be the right place for them because they already have their own president in this country. And one of the things that uh, we've been searching for is that there's already companies selling land in Patagonia, which is the south of Argentina, only for Jew people, you know, to for be Jewish people, for Jewish people. Yes. 
only for Jewish people. If you are not a Jew person, you cannot buy land in that community, at least in the Argentinian Patagonia. That is happening right now. And we found it and we say it, and of course they don't recognize it. But uh, at the same time, uh, it's obvious that it's a reality because all the people that live in Patagonia, even the indigenous Mapuche, that are the native people in, in this part of the country, um, they know that uh, it's something very common to see Israeli soldiers walking around Patagonia uh, without any touristic uh, purposes, let's say mm -hmm. that way. So this part of uh, our country is something that they always have an interest. And if the things are not going well in the Middle East, uh, I'm sure they are searching for, for another place to stay. And as you say, in the 90s century, Theodor Herz write it, you know, he wrote it uh, very clear in that book, which is called The, the Jew State, uh, that for them, there are two places that in which uh, they could build uh, their own country, and one of them is still Argentina. So we are not sure if um, that uh, option is over for them, or there's only another strategy. So maybe they use the military strategy for Palestine and the political strategy for Argentina. There is a debate uh, going on in, I don't know, let's say, let's call them uh, leftist circles in the United States. There are those uh, who argue that, you know, that Israel is uh, the is controlling somehow the United States, uh, whereas there's others who will say that, uh, well, Israel being a colonial project, a um, an unsinkable aircraft carrier in the Middle East, in West Asia, uh, for the uh, U.S. imperial project, uh, can't really be the tail wagging the dog. And I'm wondering, from your from your perspective. Uh, if we think about this whole situation of, uh, of uh, NATO, uh, globalized NATO, NATO looking for a foothold, a stronger foothold in the, um, let's say, in your hemisphere, uh, right? Building bases, um, co-opting um, presidents, doing coups here and there. Laura Richardson visiting Chile recently. Uh, that's, uh, we were talking about uh, Southcom uh, general of Southern U.S. Southern Command. Uh, U.S. Com military command for the Southern Hemisphere, Laura Richardson, visited Chile recently and was met by socialist Salvador Allende's granddaughter, <laughs> the current <laughs> minister of defense of Chile, met with the pomp and circumstance, and they were discussing uh, the uh, cooperation between uh, the s countries of the Southern Hemisphere with, with the U.S. against China against the potential war in China. So I'm wondering, from your perspective, Sebastian, where does Zionism fit in all of this? Mm, you know, we to me they're inseparable. But if we think of, uh, let's say, the U.S. imperialism, NATO, and Zionism as being on the same team, who is the captain? It's hard to know. Uh, in here, we say we don't know what was first, if it was the chicken or the egg, but. Somehow we understand that uh, Israel is or it was a Western project, you know, a project for the Western uh, interest to stay in the Middle East. But uh, once uh, this kind of uh, Western Frankenstein started to move on his own, he became very dangerous even for the people that created him in this case, the Zionism movement. So we have, you know, in history, uh, so many moments that uh, make us understand that uh, Israel, it's already, and since many years ago, out of control of London and Washington. Uh, we have even examples before the creation of Israel in 1948, 48, like for example, in the port of uh, Haifa in 1940, there was a ship coming with a poor um, Jewish family that they wanted to 
you know, run away from um, Germany, from Hitler, from Nazis uh, people, and they came to a port of Haifa. In that moment, was in control by the British government, and they decided that they wanted to send those Jewish families to the island of uh, Mauritius, you know, near to Madagascar in Africa. But already the terrorist uh, Zionist um, groups were already working um, in the occupied Palestine. We are talking about the Haganak, we are talking about the Irgum, and they decided to blow up the ship. The name of the ship was called Patria. Uh, it's very interesting for the people that don't know about this. And they prove that they, the Zionist people, can even kill Jewish people if they think they are, you know, uh, they're not a part of their own project. Like the, that was of the reason that the, why the British wanted to send those families um, to Madagascar. So since that moment, and when they blow up even the Hotel uh, King David in Jerusalem, where the uh, British commanders uh, were over there, they proved themselves that uh, they are not going to receive orders so easily anymore from uh, England or from the United States. So right now we are seeing that, um, for example, in the um, defense system of the United States uh, are full of people that uh, are related to the Israel uh, interest. So they are going to make all the decisions to always finance the defense of Israel. So you have the American people paying taxes to the American government to finance the war of Israel against the Palestinian civilian people. And that is something that uh, is not clear for, for everyone, but they make it because they have, you know, the nest of, Zionist, of Zionism uh, inside of their own government. And that is happening um, in the United Kingdom and at the same time in the United States. Uh, yes, and um, uh, that reminds me of the USS Liberty incident. This is in 1967, during the Six-Day War, uh, a uh, U.S. Uh, Navy technical research ship, USS Liberty, was attacked by uh, Israeli Air Force, Force uh, uh, jet fighter aircrafts um, and torpedo boats, uh, and I believe this uh, this incident was completely swept under the rug. I only th I think that only perhaps survivors of that incident still try to bring it up, but it's absolutely hush hush. You won't hear about it in mainstream media. Uh, you know, in talking about media control, uh, you know, uh, you you are uh, producing a weekly show uh, on an Argentinian TV channel. Um, tell us about that, the media control, the intimidation about information uh, that is contrary to Zionist interests in Argentina. How do you carry that out and what kind of uh, lawfare, perhaps, you know, <laughs> repression are people facing in Argentina for speaking up like you do? Um, we know that we are risking our own life, you know, this is the first time that I am in Argentinian TV, to be honest, because uh, there's a, a company that decided that not to be part of a Zionism a media corporations in Argentina. Uh, I think it's the first time that is happening. So uh, there's me and some other journalists that we have somehow, you know, the same point of view in, in many things that we are part of, of this project. But uh, we know that it's a very dangerous situation because for much, much less, uh, they sent people to jail here in Argentina. For example, there's a case of a very humble worker. Uh, his name 
was uh, Christian Diaz, was a worker from quite a poor area of, of Buenos Aires, Florencio Varela, and he posted in his uh, social media, he didn't even belong to any group related to the Palestinian resistance, political resistance in Argentina, and he put something on Facebook against Israel. Um, they accused him of being a terrorist, They went to his house on the, in the middle of the night and, you know, got him as he was, you know, like a, a, a terrorist or something like that, put, it, put him in a prison of uh, maximum security. Uh, he's been there for almost a year and because they didn't have any proof against him, they have to release him, but at the same time, Uh, he had this, the trial was still going on and was a very mysterious thing because in the last uh, weeks uh, he appeared uh, to be dead and the police say that he killed himself, which is very, very strange. So I think it's a message like uh, the mafia gives, you know, for every people that stand Uh, with Palestine, this is what can happen to you in a country like Argentina. And to be honest, there's a lot of people that don't go to the protest that supports the Palestinian cause because they are afraid, because they see what can happen to, to a person. And I think uh, the Argentinian um, police and the, and the forces related to the security here Uh, somehow they are controlled by the Israel. Uh, and uh, are there anti-Semitism laws on the books in Argentina? Do they go after people for free speech? And I'm wondering if they just, is it that they make an example of a few uh, people expecting others to, to be intimidated? Yes, there, there's a law, even when, from the last uh, government, not this one, because we have to be honest on, on this, uh, that is related with the memory of what they call the, the Holocaust. And Argentina signed it uh, with the, his uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs. In that moment was uh, Felipe Solá. Um, little more or less, it says that if you criticize uh, the state of Israel, the Zionism in the same way that I'm doing it right now, uh, they can accuse you and charge you of being uh, or having an anti-Semitic practice somehow. And it's a kind of a protocol that they use to threat journalists, political activists, or anyone that uh, wants to say something against Israel, that they can accuse you uh, of that. So that is something that uh, is still uh, going on in, in Argentina. But uh, what is interesting from the last uh, year, especially since uh, 7th of uh, October of 2023, is that there is a lot of people that only now realize the nature of the Zionism because they see uh, videos in in the um, uh, in internet, let's say, uh, with things that they could not believe that it could be happening in this very moment that we walk this, uh, this planet at the same time. So there's a lot of people in Argentina that is uh, waking to this uh, reality. And this is something that the Zionism in here uh, understands very well. Uh, in the U.S., uh, I see a lot of Jewish people and Jewish groups speaking up against Zionism. You know, there are groups like Jewish Voice for Peace, not in my, not in our name, uh, and they are on the front lines uh, now. Uh, Argentina has a big Jewish community. Uh, are the Jewish uh, brothers and sisters speaking up against uh, Zionism and saying, you know, when we said never again, we meant never again for anybody? Yes, um, there's, there's a group, it's called Judíes por Palestina. It means Jews for Palestine. 
uh, they support uh, Palestine. They are, you know, every time that the people march uh, on the streets in, in Buenos Aires supporting the Palestinian cause. And they say exactly that. Okay, we are Jew, but not in our name. You will, you know, oppress the Palestinian people. You will not kill them. Um, so I will not say that it's a very, very big group, at least until now, but they speak loud and they are young uh, boys and, and girls, very brave, and we admire that. Going back to um, Javier Millet and the future of, um, um, of the resistance of the Argentinian people, uh, just briefly, maybe if you could tell us what the, what the feeling is in the street. From here, we have heard about Uh, the uh, retired people marching in the streets and being brutally repressed. Uh, we're hearing about certain student uh, organizations uh, uh, organizing against the um, DNU, the uh, decree of um, urgency and need, if I may translate so mm -hmm. it's yes. so loosely. Uh, you know, tell, tell us about what's going on in terms of just political organizing against, uh, against the current government. Um, maybe... Uh, Presidential decree, maybe it would be the... Yes, the presidential decree. Presidential decree. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, in Argentina, we are not living in a democracy because uh, the President Millet right now has the power to make uh, pressure on Congress to do whatever the, the President says. And yesterday was a very important day because we have... A uh, very big uh, process related to the um, universities, public universities in Argentina, the, which is a part of our tradition here. There's public and free, so it means uh, you don't have to pay to go to university here. We are one of the few countries in the world, uh, so it's open for, for anyone. And President Millet is against that. So what he has done is basically... Um, He uh, frozen the salaries of uh, teachers, um, the money that uh, they give in for the natural function, uh, function of university is the same as two years ago. And with the uh, inflation, it's like getting out like 60%, you know, of the, of the amount. So there was um, a project uh, that came from universities that... Uh, almost 1 million students and teachers and people related with the university community uh, were asking on the streets to say, okay, uh, wherever the inflation of the country is, uh, you will have to, the, to give the same amount of that uh, average for the uh, function of university. And he made a presidential decree saying, no, we are not going to respect that. And yesterday, the Congress, the deputies, uh, support that position of President Millet. So right now, uh, today, there was uh, no class in any national university. They are taken by the students and from the uh, teachers as well at the same time, because with the money that the government is given to university, they not can even pay for electricity, see? And it's a good example of how he is trying to sell every that is important and value for the people of this country, like uh, he's selling our national uh, airline, which is called Aerolíneas Argentinas. You know, this is a big country, and sometimes to have a good communication and to keep the economic um, links with some provinces, you need an, uh, an airline that connects, you know, the people. And sometimes the private uh, airlines don't want to do it because there's not enough passengers, but you have to do it to keep the, you know, the, the country united somehow. So he's uh, trying to sell that uh, national company because he says uh, he's losing money, which is not clear. It, it seems to be not losing money, but he's saying so. And even today he's saying that He wants to sell uh, four of the most important Argentinian power plants 
to mean the, the power plants with the one we have electricity he wants yes. to sell it to, to private hands so uh, it's a very um, difficult situation but because you know the salaries are frozen for the most of the people and we have like 60 percent of children in Argentina yes. are in poverty uh, people are thinking of uh, what are they going to have for dinner and if they go going to have a dinner because maybe uh, they couldn't eat much during the day so people are not worried you know for the privatized of those uh, national companies so they take him step by step you know uh, more or less the same things that uh, happened here in the 90s right Wow. Uh, if you have a few more minutes for us, uh, otherwise, I mean, I would like to. Yes, great. Thank you. I would like to follow up on a few recent stories that you and I haven't had a chance to catch up on as they were just coming out in the news. But but I think they're still very relevant. Uh, one of them is uh, is the it's Argentina's gold. So apparently, uh, let me uh, read from uh, from a, a headline here. Uh, uh, apparently, it was discovered that um, Millet and his ministers uh, have decided that Argentina's gold reserves are just not feeling very comfortable in the vaults of the country, and they needed to take a little trip. Um, I can't find the. I, I was looking for a headline in uh, Financial Times uh, that had a curious fact, but why don't you tell me in general, in briefly about that? Yeah, it's uh, part of our reality. Um, the interesting part is that the president didn't announce that they are taking part of the gold of our national reserve and send it somewhere else because uh, they say it was uh, something that uh, they said they say some some funny uh, sentences that like uh, it it was. Um, a very high cost to have the gold in our own banks. So we have to give it to someone else to keep it from us. And that will be cheaper for us. Something stupid like that. And mm -hmm. at the same time, they hide it. They, you know, they took a couple of planes in the middle of the night. And uh, if it wasn't for some uh, workers related to the banks that took pictures and tell us, you know, and saying, listen, because they made us, they, they made them, you know, to do that uh, job. They said, listen, they made us, you know, to put uh, some part of the our national bank, our gold in some planes to go in overseas. Uh, they wouldn't know anything, but because there was that pictures related to the people, um, workers of the banks that belong to the unions, and they have some responsibility in in that matter with the, with the country. Uh, we wouldn't know. So because there was a picture, they have to accept it. And the uh, Minister of uh, Economics says that it was, was a, a good decision for them because now they can have a more uh, lucrative uh, perspective for the Argentinian goal. And mm -hmm. at the same time, you know that the goal is something you need to have a, a backup for, for your currency. So uh, Argentinian peso has no value because they, they have no support. And of course, you know, the, the Argentinians uh, need the money in their own hands. But uh, it seems that uh, President Millet is uh, seeing it in the other way around. Mm -hmm. And do we know where the gold is? We're not sure. We're not sure. Uh, the information says that they might be uh, given it to the British, but as you know, the same the same British that are occupying the Malvinas Islands. Exactly, exactly, and the same British that stole some part of the Venezuelan gold because in the governments previous of Hugo Chavez, the Venezuelan government they uh, made the same. You know, gave the Venezuelan gold to the United Kingdom uh, authorities. And when it was the moment, you know, they say, okay, we want it back right now. Uh, the British didn't give it back. 
So there's a history of British of stealing everything that they can, uh, and the goal is not uh, an exception. Uh, right, and uh, to the point that uh, at this point, after well, after the um, illegal uh, unilateral coercive measures against uh, uh, Venezuela uh, started in under the Obama administration and harshened under uh, Trump, uh, you know, with with the attempted coup and everything. Uh, well, countries are starting to trust. Uh, the West and its banks a lot less as far as their sovereign um, funds are concerned. And then after Russia was sanctioned and uh, they froze Russia's uh, reserves in Western banks, uh, my understanding is that smart countries uh, are actually shipping their gold back home as yeah, opposed but, to what, uh, what is happening in your country. It seems that we are not a smart country and we are giving our gold you know, away. So there's not a logical explanation yeah. uh, for this, but uh, they are still in us uh, because they have some secret agreements. They have to give the gold away. Well, we'll surely be keeping an eye on that. Um, speaking of Venezuela, uh, the Venezuelan um, government announced recently that uh, they were issuing a... Um, a request for an international arrest order against uh, President Javier Milei, uh, his, his uh, security minister, Patricia Bullrich, and also, I believe, uh, Milei's sister, uh, mm -hmm. for the theft of a plane that belongs to or belonged to Venezuela and, um, until um, uh, the, I believe it was under Javier Milei's government that they allowed uh, the uh, I believe the U.S. to come in to take this plane to Florida and dismantle it. Could you give us a brief overview of what's going on with that? I mean, a for a sovereign country calling out the president of another sovereign country for theft of um, um, yes, um, of a plane. it's it, it's a big story. It was a big uh, carrier plane from a Venezuelan company that, uh, of course, they use it. Uh, try to break the blockade against them and somehow they were bringing some parts of uh, cars uh, to Argentina and it was the plane was coming from Mexico and uh, this plane uh, belonged before to an Iranian uh, company it's, well, it's, it's called uh, Manar Air and because it's, it's such a big plane, uh, the crew, the pilots, uh, were still Iranians. Uh, and in the same plane, they came with uh, some um, Venezuelan uh, pilots that they were uh, learning, you know, how to fly. But uh, when they came here, because this country is um, ruled by uh, Zionism, they say that because they were Iranians, Iranians, you know, from Iran, the pilots, yeah. they might be terrorists. So they kept them, the Iranians and the Venezuelans, during the Alberto Fernandez, the Peronist governments, and they did not let them go out of the country and they kept the plane. Yeah. They've been uh, three months in a hotel until they could uh, leave the country, but they keep the plane. And then we have the change of uh, presidency. Milei won the presidency. And he had in, you know, our international airport here, Ezeiza, this huge airplane that uh, he gave to the United States. Uh, the marshal uh, from the United States uh, came here. They checked the plane. The plane was OK. And they took it, you know, flying to the United States. And when it was there, uh, the plane was, you know, cut in small pieces and sell it. So for the Venezuelan government, Milei stole a Venezuelan aircraft, which is absolutely right. So they asked for an international um, catch, whatever you say, um, mm -hmm. for Javier Milei, as you say, uh, his sister, Karina Milei, and the Minister of Security, Patricia Bullrich, because they were, you know, uh, some of the people that organized, you know, the stealing of a play for Venezuela, because 
the excuse that they have is that the Venezuela was not respecting um, the restrictions that the United States unilaterally gives for Venezuela. Right, so the sanctions. The, the sanctions. So-called sanctions, yes. The, the sanctions, the unilateral mm -hmm. sanctions. Uh, so, okay, they, they start, you know, um, uh, searching and starting um, this uh, trial uh, against Malay and asking, you know, for uh, international authorities to uh, stop the Argentinian president. And more or less, Malay say something uh, more or less the same in another way against President Maduro in Venezuela, just to try to show that they don't care much about the investigation. Mm -hmm. Well, not as if Interpol is going to get right on it. I know, don't think so. I, I don't mm -hmm. think so because, you know, Interpol somehow, you know, the, the base of Interpol is in Lyon, France. So mm -hmm. when you see where the base works of an institution, you know uh, who they belong to. Yeah. Yes. Well, what, what, what a situation. Um, uh, maybe just to, uh, to conclude... Um, Almost where we started. Well, uh, I mean, Palestine is on all of our minds, uh, but we're also concerned about other conflicts um, in uh, world conflicts, right? If we think about geopolitics. And as I was mentioning earlier, maybe uh, about uh, NATO um, looking for a global foothold. Do you think that um, NATO is looking uh, to recruit Argentina um, to be its uh, foot soldiers in a coming in the war that they're planning with China uh, against China and against uh, anyone? It could be uh, they are talking a lot about that. Um, in fact, Argentina was going to bite. Um, um, Chinese um, aircraft for for war. I don't remember the the word in in English. The J the fighter uh, fighter jets. Yeah, the fighter Fight, jets. Fighter right? jets yes, Argentina China. was about to purchase some fighter jets from China. They were going to be uh, so new. Is that, am I yes, correct in that was, they were going yeah, to buy them brand new? There's, there's um, Chinese uh, jet fights uh, that they made in Pakistan. But they they are Chinese, the J seventeen brown new, and Milay, uh, you know, closed uh, that agreement, and they bought F sixteen, almost forty years old, uh, in Europe. Um, that those are um, you know planes that um, are not what Argentina needs for the kind of uh, territory that we have. And at the same time, we are not sure with uh, what kind of a weapons the United States are going to give Argentina because, you know, um, somehow they work together with the United Kingdom that occupies our uh, Malvinas islands. So with w what we understand with that is that uh, Argentina is buying the jet fighters that... United States and NATO basically need us for our pilots to train the, themselves in uh, their own technology. So we have very good pilots, military pilots here in Argentina. So if we buy <clears throat> the F-16s, our pilots will be available to fight in any war that they need. Like, for example, you see, one of the problems of Ukraine was that uh, maybe they could have good pilots for the Russian mix because they have the, the story of that, but not with the F-16s. They were talking about the F-16s that were going to Ukraine, but you don't have good Ukrainian pilots to, to fly those planes. So now they want the Argentinian pilots to be trained in, in those uh, jets so maybe they can be used in any war that they want. And that is also an excuse that can be related to terrorist attacks here because in the 90s, Argentina, you know, was pushed to be part of um, the war in the Middle East uh, against Iraq. And Argentina sent a, a couple of ships that didn't do anything. 
but because we have after that the terrorist attack in the Israeli embassy and in the Jew organization in 1994, many Zionist analysts say, oh, because we've been in that war with the United States against countries, Muslim countries in the Middle East, they made these terrorist attacks in Argentina. So the Muslim in the Middle East are our enemies. Now we are trying to do, they are trying to do the same. They want Argentina especially to back up Israel against the Islamic Republic of Iran. You mentioned the um, 1992-94 attacks. We don't have time to get into detail. What would you recommend to our viewers and listeners if they were to get the real history of the um, of the attacks on uh, the Jewish, um, uh, you know, the, the Jewish representations in in Buenos Aires? Because uh, you know the the government blamed uh, blamed Iran, but uh, without any evidence and. Uh, The, the whole thing really did <clears throat> smell of foreign intelligence services because how how um, how convenient was it right for uh, for the Israelis uh, to all of a sudden make um, make the Argentinian government break ties with Iran and uh, and turn into a Zionist stronghold? What would you yes. recommend for listeners to read? I Iran and Argentina were partners in nuclear energy. And after that, that in here they blame Iran and Syria, they made them become our enemy. One very interesting point to remember is that in 1994, the Israel, Israeli um, embassy in London, in the UK, was attacked. And the MI5 which is the intelligence service inside of uh, the United Kingdom, make this brief. Their conclusion was that who made that uh, terrorist attack against the Israel embassy in London was the Mossad. Was the Mossad. Was the Israeli uh, intelligence service in the same year in the same year that we have the terrorist attack here in this Jew organization. So it's very obvious that they um, attack uh, themselves. And I know there's people who say uh, Israel will never attack Jew people. Okay, we Jewish, spoke, yeah. mm -hmm. Jewish yeah. people, we spoke what they have done in 1940 in Haifa against that ship, the Patriot was the name of, of the ship. If it's part of the project, they don't care who they, who they have to kill. But uh, one thing interesting is that if you want to know the exactly number of how many Israeli people died in the Argentinian embassy in 1992 and in this Jew uh, organization in 1994, In, in the embassy, they say they died 29, 28, 29 people. And in the Jew organization, 85 in 1994. Mm -hmm. how, the many Daya, of, right? mm -hmm. how many of... They died, yes, sorry. Uh, how uh, many of, of those people were born or they have Israeli citizenship? How many do you think? Well, I, I think I know the answer, but the answer <laughs> just might well surprise you. <laughs> Okay, the, ans the answer is no one. No one. No one. Okay, That's they right. might kill Jew Argentinian people. Uh, they, those are people, you know, like they're part of my country. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. No matter Jewish, which religion. Jewish citizens of Argentina, but there were no Israelis on the list. Exactly. So mm -hmm. uh, let's say the Israeli people, they always are in a place in which they don't get hurt. So Those are a couple of clues what happened in London in 1994 and, and these um, numbers that uh, there are things that you can follow, you know, to, to get the truth. Okay. 
Well, thank you for that. Uh, Sebastian, it's been almost an hour. Where can our listeners and viewers uh, find and follow your work for those of them who are Spanish speakers or just savvy enough to use um, the technology available to translate it into the language of their choice? Yeah, uh, we, we have um, this uh, YouTube channel, which is called Data Urgente. Uh, we, may, we make shows almost every day, so at least uh, four or five days a, a week. Uh, we talk you know, about uh, many, many things. Um, so I hope uh, if you speak Spanish, I hope uh, you can join us. And uh, so do I. Highly recommend it. Mm -hmm. uh, Sebastian Gracias. Salgado, thank you so much for uh, speaking to Pacifica Radio tonight. And uh, uh, we've covered some territory. And I hope to speak to you again soon, perhaps to take, take a deeper dive in some of these issues. These are fascinating things that I don't think we hear about enough, if at all, on this side of um, the planet Earth. Thank you, Polina. It's always a, a pleasure to talk to you and please send all the regards to, the, to your audience. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.